good to see everybody here this morning. Forrest is already nudging me, and he's laughing at the name of the title of the sermon this morning. And so uh, many of you guys have been around children. You've probably heard nursery rhymes. Uh, having six kids, it's just natural. You hear a bunch of nursery rhymes. And one of my favorite was, and still is, Mary had a little lamb. Has anybody ever heard that nursery rhyme? Well, I'm not going to say all of it for you, but I want to read the first line to Mary had a little lamb. And it goes like this. Mary had a little lamb. His fleece was as white as snow. This morning, I want to speak to you on this subject, Mary's little lamb. And we learn about Mary's little lamb in Luke chapter 2, uh, verse number 7. So I'd invite you to take your Bible and turn with me to Luke chapter 2. And we're going to be, begin reading this morning in verse number 7. And the Bible says this in Luke chapter 2, verse number 7. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Verse number 8. In the same region there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Now we're going to stop there uh, this morning. And I want to, let's go to the Lord and pray before we begin. Let's pray. Uh, Lord, again, we thank you for uh, having the chance to be here this morning. Lord, we know that this is a privilege. It's not something that we just have a right to do. And so, Lord, thank you for giving us the energy and the ability and the mental capacity to be able to understand a sermon. Uh, we ask that you would use your spirit this morning uh, to grant understanding to these passages we're going to look at. And Lord, use, Lord, we do pray that you would use today to, again, just, just recenter our focus. Uh, so many things, Lord, as we've already prayed, just tend to distract us and to, di to divert our attention away from the real meaning of Christmas. Well, I pray as we look at these passages, as Easton's already prayed, Lord, that you would, again, allow us to, uh, to understand, grant understanding to us. Help us to uh, talk about a subject that we may have talked about many times, but, but grant us a new layer of understanding through your Spirit. Uh, Lord, I, I do ask that you would uh, help us to make a road to application headed towards the end. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. So here we are talking about Mary's little lamb. And Mary's little lamb, as we just read here in Luke chapter 2, was born in Bethlehem. And let me remind you, you may have heard this over and over and over again over the years, but it wasn't by accident and it wasn't by incident that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Now, when we talk about Bethlehem, when, when we talk about where Mary's little lamb was born, we're talking about a place, Bethlehem, which was five miles south of Jerusalem. In fact, if Mary's little lamb had never been born there, most of us in this room would not even know where Bethlehem was on a map. But it wasn't by accident, it wasn't by incident that Jesus was born there. In fact, all throughout the Old Testament we find time and time again, prophecy or promise that Jesus, the Lamb of God, would be born in Bethlehem. One of those passages that we can speak about this morning is found in Micah chapter 5, verse number 2. It had been promised that the Lamb would be born in Bethlehem. Well, let me read to you Micah chapter 5, verse number 2. The Bible says this, But you, O Bethlehem, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth... For me, one who is to be a ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. Bethlehem is a very strategic city in the life of Mary's little lamb. In fact, did you know this? Did you know that for centuries the Jewish priest used Bethlehem, the fields of Bethlehem, to raise the sacrificial sheep? Did you know that? Bethlehem was the location where a special breed of sheep was raised to be used as the Passover lamb. So again, there it is in God's plan. It's only fitting that God's perfect lamb 
will be born there in Bethlehem. Now, again, you may be here this morning and kind of like Forrest, you think, well, how cheesy. Mary had a little lamb. But do you understand this morning that your future and your eternal destiny is wrapped up in Mary's little lamb? I want us to see four things this morning as we talk about Mary's little lamb. And the first is this, the prophecy of Mary's little lamb. Where do we see it? Where do we see prophecy or promise in Scripture about Mary's little lamb? So you've, I, I hope this morning you've already got your Bibles open, you read in Luke 2, but I want to encourage you now to take your Bible and hold your place there in Luke 2, and I want you to turn back to Exodus chapter 12. Let's see this promise or this prophecy of Mary's little lamb. Exodus chapter number 12. We'll turn there together. Exodus chapter 12, we're going to read in verse number 1. Now let me explain a little context of what's going on here. God's people, the Jews, the Israelites are here in Exodus. And what's taking place is they've spent years and years and years in slavery and in bondage. You see, the Israelites were created, they were set apart to worship the Lord and to serve Him. But now they find their place here in Egypt not having the opportunity to serve and worship the Lord. They're actually having to serve an evil man, a, a taskmaster by the name of Pharaoh. But here, along the way, God has a plan to set His people free from bondage and slavery. And that plan includes a little lamb. Well, where do we see that at? Look in Exodus 12, verse number 1. Let's read this together. The Bible says, The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Till all the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of, the, of this month, every man shall take a what? They shall take a lamb, according to the Father's house, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his nearest neighbor shall take according to the, the number of persons, according to what each can eat. You shall make your count for the lamb. Now he goes on in verse number 5 to give the qualifications of this lamb. Verse 5 says, Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. And on the 14th, and, excuse me, verse 6, and you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of this month, and when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. So here they are as slaves, and God's going to set them free. And what's He going to use to set this people free from bondage? He's going he's to use a lamb. Out of all the animals that God could have used, a lamb? Why would He use a lamb? I mean, think about a lamb. They're defenseless. They're meek. They're gentle. Lambs don't have fangs. They don't have claws. They, they don't have horns. They can't run. They can't fight. A lamb, think about just how meek a lamb is. And that's what the Lord's going to use. A lamb literally says, hey, are you hungry? Just go ahead and eat me. <laughs> when you think about a lamb, hey, are you cold? Just go ahead and shear me off. Stay warm. And yet here the Lord is going to use a lamb. A lamb presents itself as just ready to be slaughtered. I heard a story one time of a man that worked in a slaughterhouse. And in this particular slaughterhouse, they worked up beef cattle. Well, along the, along the way, the, uh, the plant decided that they're going to start processing lambs. And this man's job was to cut the throat of the lambs, to, to slaughter the lambs. And he, he began to recall, whenever those steers would come down the chute, I mean, they were wild. I mean, they would fight and just carry on. But whenever those little lambs come down the line, do you know what? They just, they just gently, meekly made their way. And as that man come up to hit the first lamb that he was ever to slaughter, it was as though that lamb just kind of lifted its chin back. Well, the man slit this little lamb's throat and... That little lamb just seemed to look up at him and then started licking the blood off the man's hand. That man just couldn't handle it. So he laid down the, the knife and he, he resigned from his job right then and there. See, lambs are so meek. They're so mild. They're just so gentle. 
And yet God here in Exodus was going to use a lamb to deliver His people, the Israelites. Now you think, who's this lamb going to go up against? He's going to be going up against the Egyptians. Do you remember what their symbol was? It wasn't a lamb. We spent a lot of time on Sunday nights talking about Exodus. And if you guys remember Pharaoh and his sort of symbol of his power was a serpent. If you were to travel over to London to the British Museum, they actually have some of uh, Pharaoh's headdresses and his staff, and, and there's always this symbol of a serpent on it. And here's a lamb without fangs or anything going against a serpent. Now again, let me remind you, we're talking about the lamb in prophecy. So let's notice here in Exodus, what, what do we see about this lamb in prophecy? Notice first, and look in your Bibles with me at verses 5 and 6. This lamb in prophecy, it was a special lamb. Look what, what verse number 5 says. It says, Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male a year old. You may take it from the sheep or the goats. So what he's saying there is not any lamb would do. It had to be without blemish. Let's read verse number 6. It says, And, on, and you shall keep it on the fourteenth day of the month, and when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. So again, guys, according to verse number 5, one blemish would disqualify a lamb. So here in, in history, and what would happen is the priests would take the lambs, and they would examine every part of the lamb. They would look at its eyelids. They would look in its mouth. They would uh, look inside of its ears for any sort of blemish. And just by one blemish, that lamb would be disqualified from the sacrifice. And what does this do? This, again, reminds us of Mary's little lamb, who was without spot. It was, he was without blemish. But not only was this lamb a special lamb, this lamb was also a slain lamb. Look at verse number 6. What does the Bible say here? The Bible says at the end of verse number 6, the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. So what they would do historically here in Exodus is they would take the lamb on the tenth day. And then on the fourteenth day, the leader of the home would take that lamb. And what he would do at 3 p.m. is he would lift back the chin of the lamb and he would kill the lamb. He would cut its throat. And there would be someone there underneath the lamb with a basin or a bowl, and they would, they would catch all that blood as it flowed from the little lamb. So again, this is a prophecy about Mary's little lamb that would one day be butchered on a Roman cross. So we see a special lamb, we see a slain lamb, but, but then the Bible goes on to tell us he was a saving lamb. Where do we see that? Look in your Bibles at verse number 7. The Bible says... Then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. Now, I'd encourage you to go on down to verse number 12. The Bible says, For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and on all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. Verse 13, The, the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the lamb. So what's God saying there in these verses? He's saying once you take that lamb, once you kill the lamb, take that blood from the basin and go ahead and paint your doorpost. Now why would He tell them to do that? It's so that everyone who comes into the house would come through and under the blood. That's the way in which they would be saved by coming through the blood, under the blood. Why? Because the death angel was coming there in Exodus. Death was coming. But God said whenever he sees the blood, he will pass over. Now, again, we want to emphasize this before we go on. Nothing but the blood would do. God didn't say, well, maybe you should take a really good quote uh, Maybe you can get it from Hobby Lobby or something. And just go ahead and write it on your doorpost. And then God will see that and He'll know that you're sweet and you're kind. Then, then He'll pass over. No, that wouldn't do. God didn't say to take off the doorposts and go down and have them embossed in gold so that when the Lord comes by, He can, he can see how hard you've been working and, 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 and you're well off and you're doing good. And, and then He would pass over. The Lord didn't say that. 
He didn't say to take a perfectly good lamb that was living and set it outside the door. Why? Because it wasn't the life of Christ that saves us. It was the death of Christ that saved us. So we've seen a lot here. We, we've, seen, uh, we've seen a special lamb, a slain lamb, a saving lamb. But what else do we see? We see a shared lamb. We see that in verse number, uh, verse number 8. Guys, look at your Bibles. It says, They shall eat the flesh that night, roasted on the fire, with unleavened bread and bitter herbs, they shall eat it. So what took place here is the lamb, after it was slaughtered, they would take it and they would roast it. And then they'd eat every bit of the lamb. This roasting process reminds us of Christ enduring the fire of God's wrath. It, it foreshadows something to come. But, but whenever they roasted this lamb here in Exodus, they would, they would then eat it. So what are they doing? They're internalizing the lamb. And as this group of slaves internalized the lamb, they went from being slaves to being free. So what happened after they internalized the lamb here in Exodus? They're walking out of Egypt and a lamb walked out inside of them. Is this making sense so far, guys? So what do we learn here before we move on to number two? What we, we understand is in, the lamb here in prophecy was a special lamb, a slain lamb, a saving lamb, a shared lamb, and we as New Testament believers need to understand that this slain special lamb, when we internalize Mary's lamb, that delivers us from bondage as well. And guess what? We feed upon the lamb day by day. We internalize him. So first, we've talked about Mary's little lamb in prophecy, but now we need to move on to number two. What else do we see? Now we see Mary's lamb in history. So Mary's lamb was a real lamb. He really came. He really lived. John the Baptist said in John chapter 1, verse number 29, he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Jesus really was in history. He was real. In history, he really was a special lamb. Well, what made Jesus special in all of human history? In all eternity, what made him special? Jesus also was, at, was without spot or blemish. He did no wrong. There was no sin found in him. And much more than that, Jesus was also born of a virgin. He was also a special. There's no one else that that has ever happened that is only unique to Jesus Christ. Not only was he a special lamb, Jesus also was a slain lamb. So why was Jesus born? What was the purpose? He was born in order that he would die. Now, why was he born sinless? Why was he born of a virgin? In order that he could make proper atonement for sin. You see, every son of Adam, every normal man, they, they couldn't justify. Because in Adam, all men died. They're, they're sinful. They couldn't make sacrifice for their own sins. Now, this is pretty neat. Did you know that the blood that flows in a little baby is determined by the Father? Did you know that? Every baby, their blood is determined by who the Father was. So what does that mean for us? The very blood that flowed in Jesus' veins was God's blood. It was the blood that come from the Father. Now somebody in here is going to say, well, how is that possible? How... If God is uh, spirit, how could... I didn't think God had blood. Well, listen to this. Acts chapter 20, verse number 28 says this. It says, Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God which He obtained with His own blood. So when Jesus walked here on earth, what does that mean? The very blood that flowed in His veins was rich, royal blood of His Father. He came to die in order that we might live. So let's, I want to paint another picture for you. We're talking about lambs. We're talking about Mary's a little lamb. 
So let's think about this for a second. Imagine all the Passover lambs throughout the years. Well, imagine this. You remember the shepherds were sitting in the field with those lambs when the angel appeared to them. Those were also Passover lambs there in Bethlehem. So the very night that the angel appeared to the shepherds with the Passover lamb, Mary was over here giving birth to the ultimate lamb. 33 years later, Jesus walks in uh, to Jerusalem. Uh, we call this Palm Sunday, the triumphal entry. Jesus is walking into the city as the ultimate sacrificial lamb. He's walking in through the eastern gate there in Jerusalem while on the other side of town there was a sheep gate in which all these lambs had been uh, taken from Bethlehem to Jerusalem and they're, they're going into the city for the Passover. Now that's on, on Palm Sunday. Now a few hours later those little bitty lambs would make it up to the temple and they would begin getting examined by the priest. They were looking for fault. While these Passover lambs were being examined by the priest, guess which other lamb was also being examined? By the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Herodians. It was Mary's little lamb that was also being examined. By 9 a.m. the next morning, Mary's little lamb was headed to Mount Moriah. All these other lambs are, are headed towards the slaughter. Mount Moriah was the very same place that God told Abraham that he would provide a sacrifice. That's the very same place that Mary's little lamb would be lifted up. That's at 9 a.m. But by 3 a.m., the priests are lifting up the throats of those little lambs there in Jerusalem, cutting their throats. At the very same time, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, Mary's little lamb at 3 o'clock is shouting out to Telestai. He's saying it is finished. The payment has been paid. It's been paid in full. Friend, at that point, the priests were no longer needed. There were no more need for the shepherds to raise those little sheep there in Bethlehem. The Levites could just go to the house. Why? Because Mary had a little lamb whose fleece was as white as snow. He was a special lamb. He was a slain lamb. And he was a saving lamb. The Bible tells us this in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 7. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Let me ask you a question this Christmas. Have you been to Jesus for His cleansing power? You guys know the song. Are you washed in the blood of the lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the lamb? So we've seen the Lamb in prophecy. We've seen the Lamb in history. Now let's see the Lamb in victory. I encourage you to take your Bible. You were there in Exodus 12. I encourage you to turn over to the very last book of the New Testament. And that's Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5. See, what we're about to see here is the throne room of God. John has received a vision and uh, he's, he's writing all this down. So let's begin reading in the very last book of the Bible, Revelation chapter 5, verse number 1. What is John seeing? He says this, Then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered. So he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, what did John see? I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he went and he took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. 
So what's taking place here? Some of you guys are already mentally checking out. Let me encourage you. We're almost done. Let's, let's finish well. Let's see the Lamb in victory. And then we're headed towards a conclusion. What did we just read about here in Revelation 5? This book or this scroll, this seven-sealed book, this is the title deed for heaven and earth and, and everything. And John sees that. But nobody's able to open up the book. This, this represents, this book represents the right to rule. John sees the book, no one can break the seals, and he's about to weep. He's wondering who's going who's to show lordship. And then look at verse number 5. And one of the elders said to me, Hey, weep no more. Behold, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered. So, so he can open the scroll and break its seals. So John's encouraged there in verse number 5. He starts looking around. Hey, there's a line that's conquered. He, he's going to rule. He starts looking around. What does he see? He doesn't see a line. He sees a, a lamb. He sees Mary's lamb. In fact, look at verse number 6. He says, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and with seven eyes. So here, let's break this down a little bit. Let's talk about the lamb that John sees. The, the first thing that John notices about this lamb standing in victory is that it's slain. Do you see that in verse number 6? It says, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain. What's John saying? The lamb still bears the marks of the nails. So what does that mean for us just as students of God's Word? Jesus' cross is still bearing the marks, the scars from the cross. So what does this mean? He, these are souvenirs from whenever He was here on earth. These are emblems of redemption. So here's a slain lamb. He can tell that. There's marks on the lamb. But what else does He see? He also noticed not only was it slain, the lamb was standing. Look at your Bibles in verse 6. I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain. This lamb had laid in the grave, but what happened? It didn't remain in the grave. This, again, is speaking to the fact of the resurrection of Mary's little lamb. So we've seen a, a slain lamb but also a standing lamb. But notice also in this description in verse number 6, this lamb is also a strong lamb. Where do we see that? Well, the Bible goes on to say, with seven horns. Horns in Scripture are representations of power. The number seven is, is a symbol for perfect power. You think of horns, any animal, you think of powerful. They're used to fight. They're used to gore. This is a little lamb, but it's a powerful little lamb. A standing lamb. But let's keep going. Verse number 6 talks about seven eyes. What does that even mean? It, it speaks to his omniscience. And he sees all. He sees all things. Again, this is describing the lamb. It's describing Mary's little lamb. But notice 7. This is one of my favorites. Look at, look at verse number 7. And he went and he took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. So again, John's standing there. Hey, who can open it? Someone says, well, the lion can. And then he sees a lamb. Now, what gives this little lamb the right to go to the throne room of God and take this scroll and open it up? What gives him this right? Now, this is what Mary's little lamb would say. I have the right of creation. I can open up this scroll because I have the right of creation. I've created it all. But not only does this lamb have the right of creation, again, the Bible says in John chapter 1, verse number 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. God Christ has been there since the beginning. He, he has authority to go to the throne room of God. But not only that, the right of creation, He has the right of Calvary. He shed His blood for it, for that right to open the scrolls. The right of creation, the right of Calvary, but also the right of conquest. What does that mean? I had to come up with a rhyming word. It means that he conquered death. He conquered death, sin, hell, and the grave. He was raised from the dead, so he has the right to open that scroll. Now, one last thing. I, I promise we're going to be done. We've seen the lamb in prophecy, the lamb in history. We've seen the lamb in victory. Now, notice last, and this is our application, the lamb in majesty. Let's keep reading. 
Got your Bibles open? Look at verse number 8. The Bible says, And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seal. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God. And from every tribe and language and people and nation, and you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Then I looked and heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders and the voice of many angel, angels, numbering myriads. Again, that's the highest word in the language whenever Scripture was written. Myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And we're going to stop there. But here's our application. We're going to an invitation. Easton and Miss Cynthia are getting ready and Miss Tiffany. I want you and I want to encourage you to, to join me this Christmas. I, hold on, we're not packing up. I want you to join me this Christmas in saying, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain. Mary's the little Lamb whose fleece was white as snow. He alone is worthy of our praise and our, ador and our adoration. He is exclusively worthy of our worship. He's the only one that we should be worshiping this Christmas. Is that true for you and your family? What are you spending your time, your money, and your resources seeking this Christmas? Is it Christ and His glory? Are you seeking to serve other people instead of yourself? Remember, the order is Christ first, others second, and self last. If you get any of those out of line, we're sinning. He alone is exclusively worthy of our worship. But not only that, He is exceedingly worthy of our worship. All of our power, all of our need to be to worship Him. Not only that, He is eternally worthy of our worship. So if we spend every ounce of every breath the rest of our life here on earth praising the Lord, He would be worthy of it. But not only that, He is eternal. If we spend the rest of eternity praising His name, He would be worthy of that. Is anything else that you're worship, worshiping eternally worthy of it? I would submit to you, it's not. I invite you to bow your heads and close your eyes as we go to this moment of invitation. I want to pray for us, and then we're just going to shoot straight to the invitation. Uh, Lord, we again want to come to you collectively as a church, just letting you know we do believe that you are exclusively worthy of our worship. Lord, help us in which we are prone to have wayward hearts that just seem to get so distracted, so easy. Even after hearing a message, just directly after a service, Satan is tempting and, and pulling our affections away from that which is most important. Lord, help our unbelief. Help this message to become internalized this morning. Not just to be hearers of your word, but to be doers as well. Lord, You shed Your blood in order that we might become free. We're no longer enslaved to sin because of what You have accomplished on the cross. Lord, we again want to acknowledge that You were the perfect, all-sufficient sacrifice. We don't need to do anything else to earn favor with God. Lord, You have accomplished it all. Help us to again internalize that reality Lord, we pray that you would become resident in our lives and Lord, Lord, if there's anyone here this morning that has never fully surrendered to your Lordship, I pray this morning would be the morning. But Lord, I also know for a fact that there may be many of us in this room that have allowed other things to compete with our affections. Lord, deal with our hearts now. Forgive us of our sins. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.